Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I'd like us to start with prayer, and I will echo a prayer of an old saint gone before us. O fountain of all good, destroy in us every lofty thought. Break pride to pieces and scatter it to the winds. Annihilate each clinging shred of self-righteousness. Implant in us true lowliness of spirit. Abase us to self-loathing and self-abhorrence. Open in us a fount of penitential tears. Break us and then bind us up. Thus will our hearts be a prepared dwelling for our God. Then can the Father take us Take up His abode in us. Then can the blessed Jesus come with healing in His touch. And then can the Holy Spirit descend in sanctifying grace. O Holy Trinity, three persons in one God, inhabit us, temples consecrated to Thy glory. When Thou art present, evil cannot abide. In Thy fellowship is fullness of joy. And beneath thy smile is peace of conscience. By thy side, no fears disturb. No apprehensions banish rest of mind. With thee our hearts shall bloom with fragrance. Make us meet through repentance for thine indwelling. Nothing exceeds thy power. Nothing is too great for thee to do. Nothing too good For thee to give, infinite is thy might, boundless thy love, limitless thy grace, glorious thy saving name. Let angels sing for sinners repenting, prodigals restored, backsliders reclaimed, Satan's captives released, blind eyes opened, broken hearts bound up, the despondent cheered, the self-righteous stripped, the formalist driven from a refuge of lies, the ignorant enlightened and saints built up in their holy faith. We ask great things of a great God. Amen. It's amazing to think as we were just singing about being made a sanctuary. I was thinking about, oh, this was a handful of years ago. Heidi and I were driving through Oregon. It was the middle of the night, and we found ourselves on the top of a mountain, kind of out in the forest, miles away from any city, from any lights. And I've never seen the Milky Way really in all of its glory as I saw that night. But what was impressed upon me in that moment was of all this beauty and creation that I see, somehow I and my wife were the only thing, at least in my vision, this Milky Way Only myself and my wife were made in the image of God. Only us were made to be these living temples, these living sacrifices. This morning we will be considering how this great honor that was bestowed upon us, we so often, instead of being humbled and content and being temples, to the one God, instead make gods of ourselves. Well, our central scripture on this Lord's Day will be 1 Samuel 5, 2 through 5. 1 Samuel 5, 2 through 5. Please stand with me as I read this. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Then the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, and behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again, but they arose early the next morning, and behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house 
tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Seated. Well, in a very short time here, we will be commemorating Christ's victory on the cross at the Lord's table. And we will be renewed in the story of God. But before that, in these moments before us, we will be worshiping as we remember and celebrate God's saving acts in history. And as Pastor John mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, I was preaching in Wendell. About a month ago, I was in Hagerman. And this is somewhat technically part three of a sermon series you guys have not heard the, far, the first two parts of. So uh, before we take a little closer look at 1 Samuel 5, we're going to refresh our memory with a brief kind of survey of the first four chapters. And as we do that, I want us to begin as we think about these beginning chapters in 1 Samuel, that we think about and we read this like inspired church history. Hannah, this is an anachronism, but Hannah was a Christian woman. Remember, there is one Lord and one faith, and those, as Paul says, who are of faith, those are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture proclaimed the gospel, bef- proclaimed the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So brothers and sisters, as you and I are sons of Abraham, Hannah is our sister saint. The books of Samuel are church history. It is our history. It is your and my history. And it is, of course, ultimately God's history. So the book of 1 Samuel begins with Elkanah bringing his wives to Shiloh for their yearly pilgrimage to the house of Yahweh to worship and sacrifice. An important thing to remember as we look at 1 Samuel is that there's actually quite a bit of overlap with the beginning of 1 Samuel and the book of Judges. Samuel and Samson, if you remember him from Judges, they were actually contemporary judges. They were judging during the same time period. So as we begin the survey, keep the backdrop of the book of Judges in mind. Israel is a complete wasteland. It's weak. It's corrupt. But the book of Samuel tells us the epic story of the defeat of God's enemies, the establishment of a kingdom, and the building of a temple. But God intentionally begins this narrative, the opening of 1 Samuel, with a woman weeping over her dead womb, Hannah. So we start the story with a common theme in the Bible, barren women. And this pattern, this idea, should remind us of what Yahweh said to the serpent in the garden. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So this major plot point throughout the Bible. A holy war between seeds. The serpent's seed and the women's seed have been at war since the fall. And 1 Samuel tells us the story of one of the pivotal battles in this history-spanning war, and it should concentrate our focus on the ministry of Christ himself. A barren wife meant the death of a family line, the death of the seed. So in this regard, a barren woman, Hannah, giving birth is akin to resurrection, life brought out of death. And as you get towards the end of the period of Judges, things are progressively looking worse and worse. The seed of the serpent is pressing in. Apostasy is sweeping the land, and the people have been playing the harlot with false gods for hundreds of years. Could remind you of some of the things we see in our land. However, all this is going on, and we find Hannah is in prayer. She's dedicating a child if the Lord would bless her as a Nazarite. She is acknowledging her inability to open her own womb. And this should be the nature of every true prayer. When we pray this morning, when we join on Wednesday nights to pray, when you pray with your family, when you pray in your own intimate prayers, 
These are prayers of powerless creatures confessing their powerlessness by turning to the Lord. So Israel may have been a wasteland, but the renewal began with the prayer of a humble woman in a domestic struggle. So the Lord is about to turn Israel upside down and reestablish it on a righteous foundation. But of course, Eli, as you'll remember the story, mistakens her as a woman who is just merely drunk. And this is not a good sign of things to come as we look at Eli and his line going forward. We can already see that Eli, the high priest, is lacking in discernment. Well, the Lord, as we know, does bless Hannah. She gives birth to Samuel. And after Samuel is weaned, Hannah takes Samuel to the house of Yahweh. And he's essentially adopted or put under the guardianship of Eli's house at this point. And that's when we come to the point of the story of Hannah's very famous prayer. It's actually much echoed by Mary's magnifying prayer later on in Luke. But Hannah offers this prayer to the Lord, and her prayer can be summarized in two sentences. And this is the... If you take anything away from this morning, the summary of Hannah's prayer is what I hope it would be. Holy Yahweh helps those who honor Him. Holy Yahweh destroys those who dishonor Him. Well, as we move forward, we are then introduced to the sons of Eli, who the Scripture tells us were vile men, did not know Yahweh. So Hannah is the believer where these vile priests, Hophni and Phinehas, are unbelievers, and they are unbelievably wicked. They're desecrating the sanctuary. They're treating the offering of the Lord with contempt. They've abused the people that they were actually set up to serve. They were guilty of sexual immorality, and they also were disobeying their father. You see, instead of taking the portions of the meat that God commanded be set aside for the Levites, Leviticus and Deuteronomy... Make it very clear what's set aside for the Levites, what's set aside for the priests. But these wicked priests have ignored God's Word. They were grabbing whatever they could get. If you remember the story, they're just sticking their fork in, getting whatever they can get out, taking the fat, all the portions that were the Lord's portions. They were serving themselves before the Lord. And can there be a greater insult? Stop briefly to consider how can we serve ourselves first before the Lord? Even in our prayers, are we praying for our own selfish concerns? Are we praying within the will of the Lord that He reveals to us in His Word what His will is? What about our time? Are we giving the Lord of some time that's left over once we've got everything else done that's really vital to us? Or is time prioritized for the Lord? What about our resources? Our very loyalty? Is God merely getting our leftovers? Well, the sons of Eli also commit adultery with the women that were serving at the tabernacle. Those women were being violated. The tabernacle itself was being violated. The religious prostitution that was common among the Canaanites all around them was being imported to Yahweh's house. And do we see that in our day? I believe we do. Wickedness from the Canaanites around us, from the pagans around us, wholesale being imported into the church. Well, at this point in the story, Eli offers... His sons, you'll remember this toothless rebuke. Because when it comes to the honoring of God, oftentimes, severe words are appropriate. So perhaps, fathers, there is severe sin in your house that needs a harsh rebuke, not a gentle nudge. This is for their own good and for yours. Eli's rebuke was a classic case of too little, too late. But then we see a man of God, an anonymous man of God, enter the story, and he brings a righteous rebuke to the high priest Eli. And it's the end of Eli's priesthood that is prophesied. 
and the arrival of a faithful priest is foretold. Now this prophecy is pregnant with meaning, as God would, he would soon restore the Levitical line in Solomon's kingdom. This line that he was about to cut off with Eli, he would restore that. But it would take the rest of the Bible to develop the full meaning. The prophets would continue to add to the picture of a new and a better priest, hope of a royal priest, not a Levitical priest. A righteous king who will offer a sacrifice that brings about a new covenant that secures forgiveness of sins forever, once and for all. And this is Jesus, our priestly king, our eternal high priest. And then another theme we see at this point, the man of God echoes Hannah when he says, thus says Yahweh, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be cursed. We see that Eli had kicked at the Lord's sacrifice and had failed to maintain discipline. He was honoring his wicked sons above the Lord by, the scripture actually tells us, he was receiving benefits from their wickedness. And we see this actually in even graver detail very soon, but like an animal kicking against its master, he was showing contempt. And the Lord's long suffering of this corrupt priesthood had reached its end. Eli and his sons were soon to die, and his house was to be made utterly desolate. The next part of the story is one that maybe you're most familiar with, that image of Samuel as a young man, a young lad asleep. He hears the Lord say, Samuel, Samuel. He wakes up, he runs to Eli. Eli is like, that wasn't me, go back to bed. Happens a few times. And this is another point of we should really be noticing how lacking of discernment the high priest of all of Israel was. But the Lord was speaking audibly in the tabernacle area and Eli was not. He was slow to discern what was going on. Well, we read that the word from Yahweh was rare in those days. Further demonstration of the failure of the priests. And here's where it becomes apparent that God's purpose in Samuel is to cut that corrupt line of priests and raise a faithful priest. This would seem to be the moment with judgment on his entire house where Eli should have wept in repentance, but he does not. And the physical blindness that the Scripture tells us about is surpassed by his spiritual blindness. Well, we're getting very close to our text today. The next thing that we see happen is actually the Israelites, in a sense, falling back under the rule of the Egyptians. If you remember back in the table of nations in Genesis 10 after the flood, we read this, Mizraim was the father of Ludim and Anamim and Lehebim and Nephtahim and Pathrasim and Kalasim, from whom came the Philistines and Kaphtarim. It's a lot of names of people there, I know. But Mizraim is actually the Hebrew word for the land of Egypt. So when we read that part of the table of nations, we read it like this. Egypt was the father of Kalsuhim, from whom came the Philistines. So the Philistines are descendants. They're relatives of the Egyptians. So the Lord has, in his judgment, about to deliver the Israelites back over to the family of Egypt. Yahweh is sending the Philistines to devastate his house, just as he would later send the Babylonians to devastate his house. And he would later send the Romans to devastate his house. Well, there's an initial battle, and Israel suffers a setback. And this is really kind of the breaking point in the story. This is the, the plot point that turns everything Instead of seeking repentance whenever they've suffered this defeat, they think creatively. They try to figure out what, what should we do other than repent to the Lord. They start thinking about their history. And, oh, I'm sure this was in their mind. Remember when we marched around Jericho and we had the ark? Remember when we crossed the Jordan? We took the ark. So 
without any kind of instruction from the Lord, without any repentance of their own. They treat the Ark of the Covenant like a good luck charm and bring it into battle. They turn to superstition over repentance. This is a danger for us as well, but it is a practice of pagans. Do not make this mistake. The Lord is very clear that it is faith that pleases Him. We should remember the words spoken to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deed you did at first. But if not, I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Then the people came into the camp. This is um, there in 1 Samuel 4 when they're trying, they're basically coming up with this idea which ultimately feeds back to a a seed of idolatry. Scripture says, Then the people came into the camp, and the elders of Israel said, Why has Yahweh defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So while the Ark of the Covenant was the throne, it was not the Savior. So they, in their minds, are saying, let's get the ark, it will save us, instead of turning to Yahweh in repentance that He might save them. And it's a very foreboding image here as Hophni and Phinehas are accompanying this ark into battle. These are two doomed men. We already know the prophecy has already been given to Eli that his sons will die. And it's an interesting note that Just as the era of the Mosaic Temple began, if you remember, with the death of the two sons of the high priest, remember the story of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and their idolic worship, that was how the Mosaic Tabernacle era began. So it comes to an end with the death of the two sons of the high priest, Hophni and Phinehas. God has abandoned the sanctuary at Shiloh. This is in many ways as significant a moment as the destruction of the temple. This is somewhat the destruction of the tabernacle. The ark never returns again to the tabernacle. It's not until in Solomon's kingdom that um, there is a unification of God's house and the tabernacle uh, and the ark of the covenant and all of the elements. Eli, in fact, his soon-to-be-born grandson will be named Ichabod, meaning the glory had departed. And indeed it had. This is the end of the Mosaic Tabernacle. But while judgment had fallen upon Israel, we see here glimpses of the Gospel. We see God taking the covenant curse upon Himself. It's the ark that is exiled from the land. God does not yet exile the people. He will. But at this point, He is sharing in their humiliation. Moses had warned them. Warned Israel that they would would be driven from the land if they didn't obey the Lord. But Israel had been playing the harlot again for centuries. But in our own salvation, it's Jesus who ultimately becomes the curse on our behalf. And as so often before and after, the Lord brings a flood of judgment, but on the other side of that flood, a new world. The ark has been captured. The high priest is about to die on the very same day, but the era of The temple and David's kingdom is on the other side. The Philistines defeat massively Israel's armies. Eli's sons are killed. The ark is captured by the Philistines. But God was victorious that day. He was victorious over wicked priests. He was victorious over Israel's armies. 
he was victorious over Eli. And it makes you think sometimes that the fall of leaders or massive institutions in the church is not always a tragedy. It can be a sign of God's work to renew his people. We see this, I'll pick on others for a moment before we look even closer at ourselves, but the hardening of mainline denominations to God's teaching on sodomy and abortion, for example. This may be a prelude to their overthrow. At this point, Eli is 98 years old. The Bible tells us his eyes have set. He has completely gone blind, physically and spiritually. Eli's rule has come to an end. And upon hearing the news that the ark has been captured, he falls off his seat. God has dethroned Eli. The Bible actually tells us that he broke his neck because he was fat. The impact of his body weight broke his neck. And we know how he got fat. He got fat off of stealing the Lord's portion that his son stole from the Lord. So the Lord dethrones Eli and uses his own sin to destroy him. This is justice, and we should examine closely today. Are we honoring the Lord in our homes, in our church, in our cities, or are we dishonoring Him? But again, as we see all throughout the Bible, the defeat of God's people, God uses it merely as a prelude to victory. Let's read that portion again as we've now done our quick survey to get us up to speed to 1 Samuel 5, starting in verse 2. It says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Then the Ashdodites arose early in the next morning, and behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But they arose early in the next morning, and behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. It's an amazing narrative here. It's important for us to remember that while the ark is not God, Israel has just made that mistake, but while the ark is not God, it is His throne. It was His throne. And that throne had just been placed in Dagon's temple. The Philistines treated it as a war trophy. See, they thought Dagon had defeated Yahweh. This fish god, Dagon, was the chief idol of the Philistine pantheon. And some of the mythological backgrounds tell us that they considered him to be actually the father of Baal. So this is uh, one of the big, big idols. And they they were proclaiming Dagon's victory over Israel, and in doing so, proclaiming Dagon's superiority to Yahweh. It's a theological statement whenever you claim something to be superior to God. In fact, it is the very essence of idolatry. And actually, this is part of that some of the overlap of 1 Samuel and Judges where you have to line up the years, but 20 years later, they would bring another war trophy to that temple, Samson. And at that point, the entire temple, along with all of the Philistine lords, would be destroyed. But on that morning, when they, the Ashdodites walk into the temple, and some of this I like to uh, to imagine, 
what their thoughts were, what they thought when they walked in. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was some security camera to see like what happened during those two nights? How did Dagon fall? How was his head and his hands cut off? It's interesting to think about. But we have here for us in God's word all that we need to know. So, Dagon had fallen before the throne of God. He had fallen prostrate. He had been made to bow before the throne of God. The serpent slayer was winding up to be slaying a serpent. Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground and was made to eat dust just like the serpent was cursed to do. And of course, then the next day he was broken in pieces. So while the Lord had gone into exile in place of his sinful people, along the way, he goes ahead and destroys their enemies. And here again, we see the gospel. It is by Christ's own humiliation. It is by Jesus' humiliation that he defeats Satan, sin, death. It is by Christ's humiliation that he triumphs over rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Christ's humiliation in his beatings and his death was the tool of his defeat over Satan, sin, and death. Likewise, at this point in 1 Samuel, the humiliation of the ark by being brought into the temple of Dagon was the tool to defeat this idol. And it makes me think of the Apostle Paul when he says, Therefore I am well content with weakness and with insults, with distresses, with persecutions and hardships for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So when Christ asks us to consider persecutions and hardships, insults and distress as something we should be content with, it is not Him asking us to do something that He Himself did not do. It was in Christ being made weak that he displayed his awesome strength. And we are not called to be forever weakly loser Christians, but we are called to be strong. And the way that we are called to be strong is to be content with humiliation for the sake of the Lord. Because the Lord will be vindicated and we will be vindicated with him. We see that The first thing he did, he didn't just on the first night cut Dagon to pieces. The first night he humbled Dagon and forced him to bow. And this is kind of a funny thought. This false god was incapable of even getting up without help. The people had to go in, rush in, and prop him back up. And I was thinking, like, what kind of god needs... I was thinking of those old... Push buttons like, help me, I've fallen and I can't get up. What kind of God needs life alert? But the Lord delivers the next night a head wound, a kill shot, and he destroys him. The serpent's head crushed, Dagon's decapitated head on display in his own temple. This is very serious for us. We see how God deals with idolatry in and among His people and out among His enemies as well. And of significant concern for us in a society that has turned from the Lord and by and large turned to idol worship is the paths of our children and our grandchildren. The church has seen generations increasingly abandoning the faith and playing the harlot with other gods. We've seen our children, our grandchildren, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, 
and they are gone. They have apostatized. We are losing our children to idols. And we must be able to discern the age. We cannot make two versions of the same mistake. We cannot retreat into separatism. We cannot behave like the Mennonites or the Anabaptists or the Amish and try to completely avoid it all. That's not what we are called to do. But we also cannot merge, capitulate and merge with a pagan world. We must retain our distinctiveness while being a witness. And we can't restrict the idea of in our mind, this is easy to do, restrict the idea of idolatry where Islam and Buddhism and Hindu, like, oh, they've actually got these statues or other gods that they've given names to. We can't restrict idolatry in our minds to that. They're more honest idolaters, but there are really only two options. You worship Yahweh or you worship an idol. And many in the church today are like the corrupt line of Eli. And they will use religious terminology but embody the values of the world. These are some of the biggest dangers to our children. False religions that are insulating themselves in our churches and leeching us of any distinctive values. Churches that have gone down this path have forsaken their duty to judge and instead have chosen to befriend the wicked powers that dominate the world. So we must identify idolatry as it is sneaking into the church, as it is being taught in secular institutions, as it is attempting, as it is attempting to poison the minds of our immature and vulnerable in the faith, and as a danger for every man and woman in this room, as we are all apt to be God-makers. So while we do not contend specifically with a God called Dagon or contend with Philistines as a particular name today, we contend with new false gods. You're hearing more and more the term used to define some of what's going on in discourse in our society, the term culture war, but I think we are much more honest to call these religious wars. This is Yahweh versus all other idols. And wherever there are Philistines, the Lord fights them. If there are Philistines in our city council, the Lord will fight them. If there are Philistines teaching in our colleges, the Lord will fight them. If there are Philistines in office in Washington, the Lord will fight them. If they are in Moscow, if they are in Beijing, if they are in the Southern Baptist Convention, if they are in our families, the Lord will fight them. And our Lord is high above all the idols of these nations. And He will vindicate His soul supremacy in their very house of worship, just as he did with Dagon. It was in Dagon's temple that he declared his supremacy. And just as the Lord's throne was established in Dagon's temple, it will be established everywhere. We cannot be blind. We see that America seems to be deep in the plunge. But Yahweh in His time will continue slaying serpents. He will humiliate idols and He will defeat false gods. We will either be a nation that submits to God, maybe like Nineveh that turns in repentance when Jonah came to preach to them, or we will be a nation that is finally brought to an end by our own rebellion. But take faith 
church, in either, ki- in either case, Jesus and his bride are victorious. Again, we remember Hannah's prayer, Holy Yahweh helps those who honor him. Holy Yahweh destroys those who dishonor him. There's not an exception clause. This is true of nations. This is true of states. This is true of cities. This is true of churches. This is true of families, men, women, boys, and girls. This is true of you. Holy Yahweh helps those who honor Him. He destroys those who dishonor Him. It was about 20 years after that night when the Lord crushed Dagon's head that Samuel was standing before the people on the eve of God bringing them victory over the Philistines in battle. This is a couple chapters ahead in chapter 7, but this is what Samuel says. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, If you are to return to Yahweh with all your heart, Then remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and set your hearts toward Yahweh and serve Him alone. And He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served Yahweh alone. We must be like these people removing the foreign gods from their home. We must be like Jacob whenever he took the foreign gods and idols and they buried them in the ground. And we have to be able to identify what these foreign gods may be that we need to bury. We go back to think about how Hophni and Phinehas were abusing the sacrifices. And what is in our heart that's being placed above God? This is the idol that must be buried. This could be many, many things. It could be us putting our faith in our country, in a specific politician, in a specific type of government. It could be us putting our faith in a specific denomination or institution. It could be us putting our faith in our own judgment. This could be laziness. This could be unfaithfulness. This could be unwillingness to rebuke. There are many idols among us. They must be removed from our houses and then we must bury them. Because it is true, all will be humbled before the Lord. It's not just Dagon, it's not just the Philistines. It's not just the enemies of the Lord. All will be humbled. So either it will be you are humbled by your honoring of God, or you will be humbled by His destruction of you. As the psalmist says, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled, but how blessed are all who take refuge in him. So this defeat of idols thousands of years ago and this prophecy in the curses that are given back in the fall of Genesis, these are not just academic interesting things to read where we can pull up typologies and look at you know, versions of serpents and God defeating idols in history. This is why we are even here this morning. Because the seed of the woman triumphed over the seed of the serpent 2,000 years ago at Calvary, on only because of that, we can do all things without complaining. How often have you complained this last week? You remember... How often have I complained? Remember, the seed of the woman has triumphed over the seed of the serpent. This is why we can declare to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 
the serpent's skull has been caved in. And as Jesus says in John 16, take courage, I have overcome the world. We don't show up this morning asking God, please come and overcome the world. He has overcome it. And He has called us to throw aside our idols. O Lord, we bless Thee that the issue of the battle between Thyself and Satan has never been uncertain and will end in victory. Calvary broke the dragon's head and we contend with a vanquished foe who with all his subtlety and strength has already been overcome. When we feel the serpent at our heels, may we remember him whose heel was bruised, but who when bruised broke the devil's head. Our souls with inward joy extol the mighty conqueror. So heal us of any wounds received in the great conflict. If we have gathered defilements, if our faith has suffered damage, if our hope is less than bright if our love is not fervent, if some creature comfort occupies our hearts, if our souls sink under the pressure of the fight. O Thou whose every promise is balm, every touch life, draw near to Thy weary warriors. Refresh us that we may rise again to wage the strife. And never tire under our enemy until our enemy is trodden down. Give us such fellowship with Thee that we may defy Satan, unbelief, the flesh, the world with delight that comes not from a creature and which a creature cannot mar. Give us a draught of the eternal fountain that lieth in Thy immutable everlasting love and decree. Then shall our hands never weaken, our feet never stumble, our sword never rust, our shield never rest, our helmet never shatter, our breastplate never fall. As our strength rests in the power of Thy might. Father, You are the one who resurrects the dead. We worship a living God who resurrects from the dead. Strengthen us. Give us the resolve to bury our idols. Lest You destroy us. May we honor You and if not, may You destroy us. And that we ask for Your mercy. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.